I'm Chris Llewellyn Smith, the Director of Energy Research in Oxford, and it's my pleasure to be speaking to you about Sustainable Development Goal number seven, which is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Global energy use is expected to increase by 35% in the next two decades. This increase is needed to provide access to energy for all and is lifting billions out of poverty. The problem is that over 80% of primary energy comes from burning fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. The use of fossil fuels is also expected to increase, not as much as the total, but perhaps by 30% in the next two decades. This is not sustainable. In the long run, fossil fuels will become increasingly scarce and expensive. Not for perhaps a hundred years or more in the case of oil and gas, and over a thousand in the case of coal. Meanwhile, their use is driving dangerous climate change and causing very damaging pollution. The World Health Organization thinks that air pollution is responsible for over 12% of all deaths worldwide. The really big numbers are in the developing world. It's said that breathing the air in Delhi is equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day. But there are problems elsewhere and it's an issue for all of us. In the USA, for example, it's claimed that the air pollution from burning fossil fuels co causes over 8% of all deaths. Decarbonizing the energy system will also improve security of supply for countries that have without large reserves and it will rebalance the relationship between countries with large reserves and other countries. Can it be done? I think so, but it will be incredibly difficult. Indeed, I think impossible at a price that society will be willing to pay. Before looking at technology, what are the prospects for using less energy more efficiently? Over the last few decades, energy intensity, the ratio of energy use to gross national product, has been decreasing by about 1% a year as a result of improvements in technology. This decrease is expected to accelerate as a result of deliberate policies, particularly stronger regulation of vehicles, appliances, light bulbs. Further improvements are vital, but they won't do more than slow down the increase in energy use. We therefore need to replace fossil fuels with low carbon sources. In principle, we know how to do this for electricity, which accounts for some 40% of primary energy use. But for heat, which also accounts for 40%, and transport, which accounts for 20%, it's much harder. In fact, it's clear that it will be necessary to electrify much of the provision of heat and transport. But this will push up the demand on electricity and make decarbonizing electricity supply even harder. The good news is that low carbon energy sources are sufficiently abundant to replace fossil fuels. If they could be made cheaper than fossil fuels, presumably they would take over. Are they cost competitive? In terms of generation cost, wind is now the cheapest source of supply in some places in good conditions, and solar is becoming competitive. However, cost is not the same thing as value for uncontrollable sources. If, for example, the wind blows mainly at night, as it does in some places, the power it provides is relatively valueless. Getting full value from wind and solar, for example, by finding ways to store the energy they produce, is therefore a key challenge. But it will put up the cost, as will other measures that will be needed to integrate their contributions, such as strengthening the grid. Let's look at different low carbon energy sources, which I've listed here in order of decreasing current importance, starting with biomass. For biomass to provide all our current energy, we would need to find an area with good growing conditions equal to 230% of the contiguous United States and plant it with energy crops. That's obviously not going to happen. Nevertheless, I think that the contribution of bioenergy could be increased substantially by exploiting plants such as cacti, agave, and euphorbia, which grow in semi-arid conditions that are of little use for agriculture. The potential of such crops and better ways to exploit their energy content 
needs to be developed. The contribution of hydropower could be tripled, but care will be needed to mitigate the environmental impacts. The potential of nuclear power is essentially unlimited, provided we're willing to reuse fast breeder reactors and thorium reactors. The issues are that it currently seems to be relatively expensive, public perceptions and the danger of nuclear proliferation. I myself find it hard to imagine that we can make it without nuclear power and personally I don't think these issues are showstoppers. Wind can make a major contribution. The problem is to learn how to deal with the surpluses that wind farms are already producing in some places when there is little demand for energy and to integrate the contributions of energy with those of other energy sources. And in the UK at least, not in my backyardism, opposition to the placing of wind farms. Solar energy is the one renewable energy source that can in principle power the world. Costs are falling rapidly and I am optimistic that solar will soon be competitive in many places. As in the case of wind, this leaves storage and integration with other energy sources as the outstanding issues. Does it all stack up? Can we drive down the costs and develop the technologies needed to provide access to affordable, reliable and sustainable energy for all? In principle, I think the answer is yes. But equally, perhaps more important and challenging, it will require developing and implementing the economic and policy tools that will be needed to make this happen. In any case, decarbonizing the energy system will take time, so we need to get on with it. Meanwhile, we should be replacing coal, the most damaging of all the fossil fuels, with gas wherever possible and improving the efficiency with which we use fossil fuels in order to reduce the emissions and the pollution that they are causing. Am I an optimist or a pessimist about decarbonization? I know an excellent definition of a pessimist, which is that a pessimist is an optimist who is properly informed. I think I'm properly informed, and I know that decarbonisation will be incredibly difficult, but nevertheless, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist first, because if we're not optimistic, we certainly won't get on with it and we won't succeed. But second, because the young people and the school kids to whom I talk understand the importance of these issues, and I think that their generation will provide the solutions.